What's up my friend, Abby here, and welcome back to Ask Abby, where I answer your writing questions and help you make your story matter. It's been a little while since I did one of these videos. I know I promise them every other week, pretty much, but last week was kind of special because we were doing like a two-part um, plot twist video. I did, uh, I broke it into two parts because one's an example video, and I had so much fun making that video. Um, it was like a case study of a bunch of plot twists from different genres. So if you missed those two videos and you're writing a plot twist, or you're anywhere near writing a plot twist or thinking about a plot twist, definitely check those videos out. They'll be linked right there. But yes, comment below right now and tell me how are you guys doing? How is everything? How is your writing projects? How are your writing projects going? What are you currently working on? I know a lot of you are in the Start Your Story Challenge Facebook group, which is a writing challenge that I started with my sister, Kate. And um, it's been so cool and encouraging to see everybody in there talking about their current works in progress. I have not been writing as much as I would like to. Life has been pretty crazy busy lately. I've been working on some new projects all of which I'm very excited about, and uh, some of which I'm gonna share with you very soon, so stay tuned for that. Um, but I've been wanting to get into uh, more of a writing routine, so I'm still working on that, still looking into what is working best for me in this season of life, and I really think that's the best way to create routines with writing or anything, is not to like hold yourself accountable to like, okay, we're gonna do this routine, we're gonna do it like this, ad infinitum. Just that's how it's gonna work. It doesn't work forever. It may serve you for a season, but then you have to move on to something else because it gets old, it gets, it starts to just not work anymore. So I find with myself that I have to change up my routine every once in a while and it really helps to change it up and to have something new and exciting that you're doing. A lifestyle change, yes. Okay, so that's my writing update or the lack thereof. Let's get to the questions. Why does your story matter? Good question. What if I told you that there's a science behind every great story? I don't just teach you how to write. I teach you how to change the world with your story and make your author dreams come true. In case you're new around here, this is how this show works. You post your questions in the Writer's Life Wednesday's Inner Circle Facebook group and hashtag it Ask Abby. And every other week I show up here on YouTube to answer those questions. I usually pick three to four questions each time and yeah, I answer them live in a video. That's how it works. To get inside this secret Facebook group right here and post a question, plus get a bunch of awesome exclusive stuff, go to patreon.com slash Abby Emmons. Okay, let's get to the questions. I have them here, but I also printed them off for my convenience so I can face the camera while I read them. <laughs> First question is from Kara. How the heck do you end a story, whether standalone or series? My current work in progress is the first book in a series, and I've been stuck for a few weeks on how to end it after the descending action during the resolution. How do you wrap up everything that just happened and leave it on a satisfying end that isn't too abrupt? Thanks. The first book in a series. So are you closing everything off with a nice, nice, neat, everything is tied up and all of the questions are answered? Because if not, then you're gonna wanna kick off the next book, right? You're gonna want to have some kind of unexpected thing happen at the end, uh, either a plot twist or some kind of like second inciting incident going into the next book. But if it's just like a series, like each story begins and ends and closes off and it's an ongoing series forever, uh, you didn't clarify what kind of series it was. So I'm gonna assume that it's a continual series where you are going, continuing the story into the next book, in which case, you don't necessarily have to satisfy the reader in the way of wrapping everything up, tying up all the loose ends and answering every single question. Because if you're going to be answering questions in the next book and the story is going to continue, then you don't have to end everything. You know, you don't have to close it off completely. It can be abrupt. In fact, abrupt endings can really entice the reader to pick up the next book. In the event of a story that is finished and you want to close the book, you want to end the story, how do you tie everything up? 
to some degree, you have to just do your best with answering all the, uh, all the loose questions hanging around and tying up the loose ends because there are always going to be people who think it's too abrupt. That's it's kind of like it's like an open to interpretation thing with stories. I find is that you're going to have some people who think it's too abrupt and then you're going to have some people who think it's too long. Like it's kind of a preference thing. Some people love abrupt endings or open endings or a book that ends like suddenly and you weren't expecting to end it there. So it's kind of an artistic thing, I would say, in a story that closes off and finishes and that's it. So you have to kind of go with your gut and what you like in a story, I would recommend writing it the way that you would want to read it. But again, if it's part of a series and the story continues into the next book, then maybe ask yourself what unexpected thing can happen at the end, what kind of a cliffhanger, what kind of second inciting incident can kick off the next book and get readers to anticipate what's going to happen in the next book. Okay, next question is from Amy. Hey Abby, quick question. I know you preach the benefits of outlining the heck out of a story before doing anything else, and I'm really trying to do that, but I'm also consistently finding myself envisioning a scene that I feel compelled to really spend time detailing, almost like a tiny painting, a tiny painting. And my question to you is, do you ever let yourself stop and spend time on a single scene like that? Or do you make yourself refrain and continue to outline regardless of your compulsion? Mm. That's a good question. That's something I really haven't been asked before, I think, which is crazy. <laughs> so it sounds like you're having, you have the urge to write this story particularly out of sequential order. And believe it or not, that is a whole writing style. Like there are probably writers out there listening to this video right now. In fact, tell me right now in the comments if you are a writer who writes scenes out of sequential order because I've met a lot of writers who do this. I personally haven't done a lot of it, but it is a writing method that you get this scene that comes to your head and you're like, I need to write it right now. And it's if it's complete in your mind and you're like, I want to write this scene so bad, then do it. Stop and do it or outline it in detail because I do that. I outline a scene in detail, like down to <laughs> what they're going to say, like pieces of the entire conversation and descriptions and things like that, um, because I, I do feel the need to write down the details sometimes and to really just enjoy writing that scene before I get to it. Because here's the thing that might happen. If you're eagerly anticipating writing this scene so much that you just want to hurry up and get to that scene, then the rest of what, whatever comes before that might end up feeling a little bit rushed or forced or just not inspired because you're kind of hurrying along to get to that scene that you really did want to write, you know what I'm saying? So in some cases, it can be better to write out of sequential order and to write what you really want to write right now and then put the scenes in order where they belong later. And you can always go back to those scenes that you wrote out of sequential order and add in details that make more sense now in light of the whole picture. But it's really a stylistic thing. It's up to you and how you want to write. I do recommend outlining before you write the first draft. However, if during your outlining process, you feel really inspired to write a scene in particular out of sequential order, then by all means, do not restrain your creativity. Do it. All right, next question is from Sean. This may be too vague, but at what point in your writing do you start to really develop your style or voice as a writer? Do you know what it looks like? I've written a lot over the years, but I'm unable to concisely tell you the answer. Thanks, Abby. It was a pleasure. That's a good question too. Um, I really think that writing style is something that you acquire over time by writing. <laughs> it sounds like so simple. It's like almost not even helpful advice, but I have written a lot of words, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of words actually over a million words now. <laughs> Most of those words were probably fan fiction, uh, which a lot of people would look at and be like, that's a waste of time. Why'd you waste so much time writing fan fiction? But I argue the case of fan fiction all the time because it is so, so good 
for practicing your art. Practicing writing is really the only thing that's gonna make you a better writer. I say that to every single person who asks for writing advice or like, how do you become a good writer? How do you become a better writer? Write. Like it sounds so simple, but just writing and finding your voice, finding your style that comes with the practice with writing. And I know that you've, you say you've written for years and it sometimes it takes years and years and years before you realize like, huh, that's, that's my style. It's also worth mentioning. I think that style will change depending on what book you're writing and also what genre you're writing. Um, my style has changed so much from book to book, depending on what I'm writing and whose voice I'm writing. So I like to think of it not so much like this is my writing style. This is Abby Emmons writing style. I think of it more like this is this character's writing style. This is this character's voice. So it's not even my voice. It's like I'm trying to slip into the character's voice so much that you don't even think of it as me. I don't even want you to think of it as me. Like, I want you to think of it as the character. <laughs> so I think that's actually a more constructive way to look at it, is not so much finding your voice, but finding the character's voice. So when you're writing from this character's perspective, even if you're writing in third person, how can you give this book a different flavor, a different feeling, a different voice um, than your other books? And of course they will all have similarities because we all have our own voice in the book, regardless of whether we want to have it in the book or not. Like it's your, your voice is going to translate into the book, whether you like it or not. And you might not even know what your voice or your style is until someone tells you. So someday if you've already published books or when you publish books, when you start to get letters and reviews and comments from people who read your book, you're, you might see some similarities of like, oh wow, your style is so poetic or so interesting. It's so, uh, they'll use words to describe your style. And you might be like, huh, I didn't even realize my style is more like that. Like I've had so many people say that 100 Days of Sunlight is like so poetic, like parts of it. And it's really only Tessa's point of view that's like that, but in my opinion, but again, that's the character voice thing. And I didn't even really recognize them. Like, huh, I guess it is kind of poetic. That's cool. <laughs> so yeah, fun fact, your readers might find your writing style before you do. <laughs> okay, next question is from Karen. Hi, Abby, I'm new here, so I apologize if you've answered this question before. How do I know when to mention incidental actions? Turning, smiling, getting up, sitting down, looking up or down, around, etc. My characters always seem to turn and smile before they talk to someone. They quickly become joyful tornadoes. <laughs> I love that, joyful tornadoes. Um, that's a good point because there are a lot of like, little incidental actions, body language that we do all the time that if you're writing realistically, you're going to want to include those things. However, not in your final draft. A lot of that will be edited out. A lot of that will be taken out in your revision process because you know, I'm going to say right now, why does it matter? <laughs> That's the question that you always have to ask yourself, even with body language. Yes. Why does it matter? If your body, if the body language that you're writing doesn't really matter, doesn't really tell us anything about who the character is, what they're feeling right now, how they're responding in this conversation, if it doesn't complement their behavior, their beliefs and their thoughts and show us something about the character, then what purpose is it serving? These little incidental actions. What do they tell us about the character and what the character's thinking right now and how the character is feeling right now? It may be meaningful sometimes for them to turn and smile. That might mean something, but if they're always doing that, you don't really need to tell us after a while. Um, these are nonverbal cues that we kind of already imagine in our head when we're reading dialogue, we already assign nonverbal cues to the characters. So unless it's important, unless it shows us something about how the character is feeling, unless it matters, don't write it. Or if you write it, you're going to want to cut it in your first draft when you go through and make your edits, especially when it appears in dialogue, because when there's an exchange with dialogue, you really don't want to interrupt the flow with too much action and too much body language. 
unless it matters, unless it matters to what's happening, to what the characters are feeling and thinking and behaving. Now there is a flip side to that where you don't want to have too few dialogue tags because then it can get super confusing as to who's talking. I've read so many books like that where I'm like, I have to backtrack and it takes me like five minutes to read one page because I can't tell who's talking. And that is so frustrating. So you do want to add in, sprinkle in this body language that makes sense and that matters to what's happening to give us a complete picture of what we're seeing, but not all of the little insignificant details that do not matter. Okay guys, awesome questions. As always, I hope you got something valuable out of them. And if you would like to ask a question for this show and have me answer it here on YouTube, you know where to go. Go to patreon.com slash Abby Emmons. Get yourself inside that Facebook group. And just so you know, it's an awesome group of so many amazing writers just like you. And we're in there all the time talking to each other and sharing and exploring storytelling together. And it's just such a fun hangout. Smash that like button if you liked this video and be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already because I post writing videos and publishing videos every single Wednesday and I would love to have you here in the community. Stay safe, my friends, and as always, rock on. <laughs> okay. Okay, Abby, stay focused. Um, uh, uh. That was a good answer. Good job, Abby. Mm -hmm.